Why don't we record a <laughs> script now that we're all in a good mood? <laughs> I knew my Wii bowling skills would come in handy one day. Come on, your turn. We only get enough time to bowl 12 games in a row once every six years. I'm waiting for this You Gotta Strike animation to finish so we can see the scores. That's not an animation. Someone's just playing Clive and Wrench. I'm not exactly sure how they hooked it to the screen, but here it is. I feel a bit disappointed that I couldn't tell the difference between a game in development for 12 years and three decade old semi-rendered low quality animation supposedly featuring bowling balls and pins. Truly you are the victim here. Kind of ironic someone's playing the game we're reviewing on a screen in a bowling alley no one knows the exact location of. We may never understand the power of coincidence. So, what is Clive and Wrench? Clive and Wrench is a 3D collectathon and platformer starring Clive, a bipedal rabbit, and Wrench, a backpack-sized monkey. These two roommates, who are attached at the shoulder for much of the game, live with Clive's cousin, Nancy. She is a scientist of some kind and has invented time, time travel, travel technology, technology, which should allow her to stop any problem before it happens, but it doesn't, and... Here we are. The story of this adventure is, one day, Nancy's blueprints for a time-traveling fridge are stolen by Dr. Dawkins' henchman, Olga Chestikoff. Hold for applause. Alright. Olga can be seen strolling through the halls of a castle that resides within spitting distance of Clive and Wrench and Nancy's home. Olga may be big, but the doors are bigger still. They stroll past an animal selling matches for five penises apiece. Olga apparently buys one, lights it, and tosses it at the animal's stock of matches, lighting and ruining them all. Because the robotic arm, root expression, overall design, accompanying weather, and demonic music weren't enough to tell us this character is evil. The blueprints are presented to Dawkus, who laughs until the scene fades. We then skip to the next morning where Clive and Wrench are asleep. Nancy strolls in, pours herself a bowl of Gyrios, and notices her blueprints are missing. There are also paw prints on the wall, clues to the culprit. She rushes to the window only to be thrown to the floor when a purple flash occurs. Wrench awakens to help Nancy to her feet. Clive awakens soon after to find Nancy explaining why Dr. Dawkins is evil to Wrench. We all know detailed images drawn in under 10 seconds on a sudden chalkboard are the only way to explain why something is bad. Nancy then presents her advanced time traveling technology, a wrist mounted travel apparatus. Instead of fixing the the entire situation right then and there, she travels to a bunch of timelines and returns with stuff from each timeline's gift shop. Clive and Wrench ask for their own apparatus only to be pointed to the fridge. And so, the adventure begins. Clive and Wrench's gameplay takes the form of a 3D platformer and collectathon, which will call on your many abilities and skills for traversal, double jumping, ledge grabbing, hovering for long distances, and running really fast when holding L are your main tools for adventuring. The tutorial level even covers about half of these moves for your convenience. The other half you get to learn via experimentation, or via this review. L makes you run on all fours, R makes you dive and crawl, you can perform a turn jump a la Mario 64 or Sunshine via moving in a direction, turning, then pressing jump. You'll jump fairly high. ZR will focus the camera behind you. ZL does nothing! Jump, run, roll, and fight your way through each level to collect colored pocket watches, which have a level total constantly present on the left side of the screen, and a grand total on the right. Level totals are present throughout the entire game and the amounts change per level. Sometimes you're hunting down 400 differently colored pocket-sized timepieces. Other times you're completely giving up on finding all 1,000 of them. Have no fear, however, as there are not 400 to 1,000 individual timepieces to collect. That would be insane! No, each differently colored watch is worth a different amount. Gold are worth 1, red are worth 2, green are worth 3, blue are worth 5, purple are worth 10. If ever you are hopelessly lost in finding the one pocket piece that escaped your vision, press up on the D-pad and a handy detector will emerge. It will point you to the pieces you missed, or to nothing, and you can plunge into an abyss, expecting adventure and receiving nothing. Also among your UI elements are the ancient stones you're meant to collect. There are 10 per level and a grand total is visible on the hub world on the right side. The in-level total is visible on the left. More elements will become visible per level such as the amount of keys you have, each level has 5, side quest hunt totals, and more. Your HP is also on the bottom right. My favorite part of the UI is the animation for when you take damage and heal yourself. Know why? They're the exact same. No differences, except the satisfying crunch of cake when you heal yourself. You know, cake! Canonically crunchy, like Jello. Each of the over 10 levels in this game take place in different timelines spanning... Uh, I'm not sure when to... I'm not sure when. The first level is an enlarged version of the main floor of a studio apartment, perhaps Clive and Wrench and Nancy's, and has framed pictures of them on the wall. And oh, framed blueprints for the time-traveling fridge, too! I'm not a terrible person. But if I saw frame blueprints for a time-traveling anything on someone's wall, 
Not much would prevent me from taking them home. There are saves and vaults and basements for hiding that kind of information. There is no boss for this world beyond your own want to collect everything. You then move on to an old-timey, London-y, Jack the Rippery timeline where you do what you just did in the large department, but all over again in a new environment. Every level follows nearly the same formula. Collect pocket watches, collect ten ancient stones, collect five keys, collect five NPCs to complete a side quest, rinse, repeat. Sometimes you even fight a boss! Operative word, sometimes. Each area in the hub world has a locked door. To get through it, you need to collect the amount of ancient stones printed on its purple, wavy front. When you do collect enough, you may be presented with a boss, or an elongated chase sequence that is just more adventuring in place of a boss or a fight of any kind. Clive and Wrench is a game with a startling lack of focus. As you play even the tutorial level, this becomes more and more noticeable as several important moves the game requires are not taught. The detector points you into the abyss, swimming feels slow and sloppy, and the camera will cause vital pieces of the environment to pop in and out of existence. These are just the first bits of jank you meet in this game. Cutscenes, animations, expressions, progression, simple collision, ledge detection, controls, enemy interaction, NPC characters, and level designs all present a level of unpolished design that distracts from the adventure you're having. Specifically in areas where your destination is at the edge of your field of view, which is this handy bubble of fog that will cause the world to pop in and out as you explore. Extremely long jumps become leaps of faith as you hope the platform you could just barely see comes into view while you gently descend toward it. Even the world the game takes place in presents an awe-inspiring level of disarray. You know, as it resides then ceases to reside within your field of view. To begin, what are any of these timelines? Some seem to reference movie titles, which are not time periods per se while others are just bad puns. Why do some of them have preloaded hub world attached areas and some are load screen addled sub hub areas? If you're not confused and or concerned already, then I want you to take a look at one thing real fast. It's a boss of one of the later levels in this game. This locust or grasshopper or weird green bug, I don't know what it is. That was not a boss. I refuse to believe you spend more than half the game finding ancient stones for a boss level door to be wasted on all that... nothing. I gave up on this game, specifically during this boss fight right here. Running through an environment I don't know only so I don't get to fight another one of the boss characters featured on the really weird and long load screen was enough for me. All of that mixed with the camera glitches, the game eating your inputs like brookie dough Oreos, and the level design to ruin your ability to move toward the camera was perfectly topped off with the one and only death cutscene in the game. Seriously, why is this here? This is animated so strangely, as is every other cutscene in the game. The energy constantly cuts back and forth from slow, steady, almost dramatic motion with comfortable easing and smooth movement to an Ed and Eddie style of animation complete with 1000 mile per hour movement and slapstick action. For example, the Roadrunner tributes, which outstay their welcome. Part of the success of the Wily e. Coyote, uh-oh, there's no ground under me gag, was timing, the camera angles, and the smears of the character. Here, it lasts entirely too long. If I may interject. It's no different than any other conversation we have where you suddenly have an idea, and it becomes more important to interrupt me than it does to listen to what I have to say. So go ahead. The story. Oh. What is the relation of all these boss characters? They all reside in different time periods or movie titles. There are even references to each other boss within other levels' time periods. So, do they know each other? Is there a consortium of evil characters across all time at Docus's call for this type of mayhem? Also, how did Olga steal the blueprints and leave paw prints on the wall? Olga is a hulking character in full costume with a robot arm and doesn't seem to hold any grudge against making noise. The story doesn't feed a need to explore each level and meeting each boss is a 5 to 30 second cutscene of confusion that only serves to sever the intrigue we have in continuing to play any more of this game. Clive and Wrench would be a more solid product if it consolidated rather than downsized what it currently presents. Over 10 levels, each with their own quests and sequences and thousands of collectibles total is overwhelming, and yet only a few proper boss fights is a letdown. If this game were instead consolidated to fill gaps and trim the fat so as to guarantee every level has a boss to fight and a more reasonable number of collectibles that are meaningful to find, Clive and Wrench would be much more digestible. The world was excited for another indie 3D platformer, but unfortunately this is yet another unpolished adventure game that has way too much content that is barely held together by rabbits and wrenches.
Can whomever is playing this game on their score screen please stop? It's been hours. We're very uninterested in seeing more of this. Thank you. Ah, crap, gutter ball. What the fuck was that? I'm not sitting through more of that. Keep bowling until they throw us out. <laughs>